The next two months passed quickly, as Easy Company refitted and absorbed a number of replacements. While many of the wounded veterans convalesced from their wounds suffered in Normandy, I concentrated my efforts on reorganizing our company and platoon headquarters. Lieutenants Harry Welsh and Buck Compton were promoted to first lieutenant, with Welsh now serving as my executive officer and Compton as second platoon leader. New officers assigned to the company included T. A. Peacock, Robert B. Brewer, and John Pisanchin. Lieutenant Charles Hudson, an officer from A Company, received a battlefield commission and joined Easy as an assistant platoon leader. So did Lieutenant Edward Shames, a former operations sergeant, who had built the sand tables we used in planning our airdrop into Normandy. Shames was the first non-commissioned officer to receive a battlefield commission from 3rd Battalion. Because the regiment was in desperate need of officers, I had the opportunity to recommend one man from E Company for a battlefield commission. I immediately recommended 1st Sergeant James Deal, who had served as my company first sergeant during the campaign in Normandy. As his platoon leader, I had worked closely with DL in the States and during our stint in England prior to the invasion. DL was by no means the biggest, strongest, toughest guy in the outfit. He was not an athlete, but he possessed a command voice, a command attitude, and he took no backtalk or guff from any soldier. He was what I called a can-do man. Give him an order and you could forget about it. He got the job done. He was the kind of soldier who made any outfit look good, and he made a platoon leader's job easy. Deal was also a self-starter, highly motivated, entirely dependable, and he had a no-nonsense, low-key leadership style that commanded the respect of the men. Diel performed commendably in Normandy, and I was confident that he was ready for the next step. While I knew that EC Company would be losing a first-class leader, and that I would be losing a good friend, recommending First Sergeant Diel for a battlefield commission was the highest honor I could bestow on him for a job well done. As it was customary that non-commissioned officers who received battlefield commissions were reassigned within the regiment, D.L. transferred from Easy Company to Able Company, where he served with distinction until he was killed in action in Holland at the bridge in Zaun on September 19th. Selecting non-commissioned officers for promotion was an easy task. The chief strength of Easy Company had always been its core of NCOs. These enlisted men had been thoroughly tested at Tokoa, had been tested again during jump school at Fort Benning, had been hardened during further training in the States and in England, and then had proven their mettle in actual combat. Consequently, we were able to restaff E Company with no discernible loss of leadership or morale despite the fact that we had lost our entire company headquarters, plus many other men in Normandy. To fill the hole left by DL's promotion, I selected Staff Sergeant Carwood Lipton as the company's new first sergeant. Lipton looked like a first sergeant should look. He acted like a senior noncom. He was smart, mature, self-disciplined, and dedicated to Easy Company. Moreover, he led by example, exactly what I expected from my first sergeant. In addition, he commanded the respect of the men. After I announced my decision, I received a letter from Ed Tipper, who was still in a hospital back in the States. He told me that, in his opinion, Lipton was the best non-commissioned officer in the whole Army. To fill the hole made by Lipton's transfer to company headquarters, I assigned Sergeant Talbert as platoon sergeant of 1st platoon. Again, it was an easy choice, particularly after his performance in Normandy. Promotions were also in line for several of the other Tokoa men. Leo D. Boyle was advanced from sergeant to staff sergeant and served as my right-hand man in company headquarters, where his principal responsibility was to help train the new replacements we would be receiving. Boyle was a couple years older than the average company non-commissioned officer. He was many years older as far as maturity was concerned. Perhaps his marriage to a local Aldborn girl a month before D-Day had something to do with his maturity and fatherly instincts. As his platoon leader at the time, I had given Sergeant Boyle permission to marry his girlfriend. First Sergeant Evans served as his best man. Also promoted to Staff Sergeant were Bill Guarnier, the second platoon sergeant, and Robert T. Smith. I had been Guarnier's platoon leader in Tacoa. I had recommended him for promotion to corporal, and later I had recommended him for promotion to sergeant as a squad leader. Guarnere was a natural leader, and one of the most respected non-commissioned officers in Easy Company. At Braycourt, 
He had done a magnificent job and I had recommended him for the Distinguished Service Cross. The recommendation was subsequently downgraded to a Silver Star by higher headquarters, as divisions seemed reluctant to approve too many recommendations for high awards for enlisted soldiers. As it worked out, Guarnere and Lieutenant Compton were the only two men from Easy Company to receive Silver Stars during the entire war. Smith had also performed well as squad leader in Normandy. Due to his demonstrated leadership and self-discipline, I assigned him to be company supply sergeant to fill the shoes of Staff Sergeant Murray Roberts, who had been killed in action. Also promoted to sergeant were Kenneth Mercier, Bull Randleman, Arthur Eumann, Don Malarkey, Warren Muck, Paul Rogers, and Myron Ranney. Ranney had been a sergeant and had been busted to private first class for his role in the Sobel Mutiny. Joining the NCO ranks were Pat Christensen, Walter Gordon, John Plesha, Daryl Powers, and LaVon Reese. The next task was to train the replacements who had recently arrived to bring the company back up to its authorized strength. The first thing we did was fire our new weapons to ensure that all rifles were properly zeroed before the next operation. With Staff Sergeant Boyle's help, we developed a rigorous training schedule that included some field exercises for the benefit of the replacements. The older survivors of Normandy were generally given the easier jobs on these exercises. Many who were still recovering from wounds were given lighter duty. Before our next mission, Private First Class Popeye, Wynn, and Private Rod Stroll rejoined the company, although both still suffered from wounds incurred in Normandy. After Wynn had been evacuated from Utah Beach following our fight at Bricourt, he recovered in a field hospital in England. When informed that if he stayed away from Easy Company for 90 days, they would send him to another company in the 101st Airborne Division, he became edgy to return. He persuaded a sergeant who released the patients to send him back to Aldbourne with papers authorizing light duty. He returned to Easy Company around September 1st and tossed the papers when the company was alerted for another airdrop on the continent. Popeye and the other veterans of D-Day were particularly tough on the replacements, cutting them no slack during the two weeks we trained for our next mission. Non-commissioned officers like Johnny Martin, Bull Randleman, and Bill Garneri refused to get too close to the replacements some of whom were no more than mere boys. As for the newly arrived troopers joining the regiment, they were justifiably in awe of the Normandy veterans, who formed a nuclear family of their own. Somehow they stood apart from the newer members of the company. To this day, those who made Easy Company's initial combat jump into Normandy sit at separate tables during the company reunions. On August 10, the 101 Airborne Division conducted a general review for General Eisenhower at Hungerford. Iki expressed his tremendous satisfaction for the Hunterwest Airborne Division and told us that he expected we would soon return to the fight. Meanwhile, we took care of more mundane matters. In Normandy, we ate K rations, which contained a little packet of lemonade for the lunch ration. The stuff was terrible. Everybody threw the packet away. What we did not know was that the packet of lemonade contained all the vitamin C requirements. After going for a month in Normandy without any vitamin C in our diet, just about every trooper suddenly developed cavities. I went to see the regimental dentist, Shifty Filer. He drilled out the cavities and slapped in the fillings. His drill was a foot-pedal-driven apparatus. My teeth were killing me. The next night I was rolling in pain. I couldn't think straight, nor could I go on sick call with a combat jump coming up any day and run the risk of not leading the company. I had no intention of being marked L.O.B., left out of battle, because of dental work. On the other hand, I was wondering how I could function in combat with that pain. Fortunately, the scheduled jump near Paris was called off, so it was back to Aldbourne and a real dentist. It so happened that the dentist hailed from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, not far from my home in Lancaster. He drilled out the fillings and announced, This is bad. Filer has cut the nerves in both of these molars. They are perfectly good teeth, and if we were back in Harrisburg, I could save them. But under the circumstances, when you might be going into combat any day, the only thing I can do is pull them. I never went back to Shifty Filer and have sworn never to visit any doctor nicknamed Shifty again. Over the course of the next 30 days, we were continually on alert for redeployment to the continent. On August 17th, Easy was notified and briefed for a drop near Chartres, to cut off the retreat of the Germans who had escaped the Falaise Argentan pocket. 
But D-Day, August 19th, came and went. On August 31st, we returned to the marshalling area, this time to jump into Belgium behind the Maginot Line. That operation was scrubbed on September 4th. In the interim between the two missions, I quietly celebrated my third anniversary in the Army. As I looked back, it seemed like a lifetime in some respects, and as if I had aged way beyond three years. In other respects, it hadn't felt that long, and I had been pretty lucky up to that point. There were not many men in Easy Company who had done as much in the same period of time. I figured that if I stuck in the paratroopers for another two or three years, put my money away at about the same rate as I had been, I would have a pretty darn good haul when the war was over. What I most wanted to do was to get back in action. Letting some other guy do the fighting for me just did not feel right. On September 10th, we were back in the marshalling area, this time for Operation Market Garden, General Bernard L. Montgomery's strategy to bridge the Lower Rhine River and to establish a lodgment area within Germany itself. The airborne component of the operation was codenamed Market and was the largest airborne drop of the war, far exceeding D-Day in the number of troops and aircraft. If the operation succeeded, my friend Captain Lewis Nixon, now serving on battalion staff, expected that the war would be over by Christmas. At our briefing, we were told that the 101st and the 82nd Airborne Divisions would be attached to the British 2nd Army, a prospect that did not sit well with the men. The 101st Airborne Division was assigned four bridges to secure in Eindhoven and one over the Wilhelmina Canal at Zaun. The mission of 2nd Battalion was to assemble on the eastern edge of the drop zone and to proceed directly to Eindhoven to seize three vital bridges with the support of the balance of the regiment. If we could seize our bridges and the 82nd could capture their bridges over the Moss River at Grave and the Wall River at Nijmegen, a British armored column from XXX Corps would advance up Hell's Highway to join the British 1st Airborne Division at Arnhem. Hell's Highway was a two-lane, hard-surfaced road that ran approximately 55 miles between Eindhoven and Arnhem. Compared to Normandy, the jump on September 17th was relatively easy. Regimental Headquarters Company 1st and 2nd Battalions closed at Membury Airfield by September 15th. Unlike D-Day, Easy Company and the entire 506th jumped in broad daylight several miles north of Eindhoven. Approximately five minutes from the drop zone, the regiment encountered heavy flak from German anti-aircraft batteries on the ground. Regimental Headquarters planes were the heaviest hit. Colonel Sink and his executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Chase, nearly suffered the same fate as Easy Company's commander on D-Day when both of their aircraft were struck by enemy anti-aircraft fire as they approached the drop zone. As Sink saw a part of the wing dangle, he turned to his men and said, Well, there goes the wing. But nobody seemed to think much about it. Both Sink and Chase landed safely and promptly organized the regiment to advance on their objectives. The only danger I personally felt was the need to get off the drop zone as quickly as possible in order to prevent getting hit with falling equipment. Since the drop zone was so concentrated, the entire 506th used a single DZ, it was literally raining equipment, helmets, guns, and other bundles. The march off the drop zone was long, hot, and dusty. We took far too long to get to the objective. I couldn't help but think, next time, drop us on the objective. As our battalion moved down the main road toward Zahn, we encountered little resistance. The order of march was D Company leading, followed by E Company, Battalion Headquarters, and F Company. Battalion had a column of men on each side of the road when suddenly a German 88 artillery piece fired down the road and we heard German machine guns open up. We sustained no casualties as D Company covered the right side of the road, while E Company took the left side. We pushed forward and were about 25 to 30 yards from our first bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal when it blew. For the second time that afternoon, we were caught in a hail of debris, this time of wood and stone. I remember hitting the ground with Nixon on my left. As the stone and timber came down, I thought, what a hell of a way to die in combat. Had we been dropped closer to the objective, we could have secured the bridge before German engineers had prepared it for demolition. In any event, we were up in an instant, and Easy Company provided covering fire as 1st Battalion crossed the canal. In the front of that battalion was the commanding officer, Major James LaPrade, tiptoeing from rock to rock trying to make his way across the canal without getting wet. He had his 45 caliber pistol in one hand as he tried to maintain his balance. 
It struck me as funny. I thought to myself, for God's sake, man, carry an M1 rifle if you're expecting trouble. Give yourself a little firepower. Furthermore, carrying an M1 makes you look like another soldier, not an officer. Snipers like to look for officers. Three months later, La Prade, now a lieutenant colonel, was killed at Bastogne. As for E Company, we crossed the canal by dark, and I slept in a woodshed that night to keep out of the rain. Later, the Royal Engineers of the 14th Field Company laid a 110-foot-long Bailey Bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal, for the tanks to cross once Hell's Highway was secured. The following day, the 506th renewed its advance toward Eindhoven, a city of 100,000 residents. As we approached Eindhoven, Colonel Sink ordered 2nd Battalion, with F Company leading, to the left flank of the regiment. F Company was stopped cold and E Company was sent to the left flank of its sister company. During the subsequent attack, Lieutenant Bob Brewer, Easy Company's 3rd Platoon leader, was hit. I had sent Brewer to lead E Company in the attack. The field in front of Eindhoven was flat with absolutely no cover. There was a slight rise in elevation as we approached the town. Brewer had dispersed his platoon in perfect formation. Scouts forward, no bunching up. The formation was perfect except for one thing. Brewer was way out front with the scouts. Being a tall man, about six foot three, waving his arms and hollering, he looked like an officer. Brewer was a perfect target. I could see it coming. Everyone could see it coming. I hollered over the radio, get back, drop back, drop back. No radio contact. He just kept going ahead. Suddenly a single shot rang out and down. He went down like a tree that had been felled by an expert lumberjack. The bullet passed through his throat just below the jawline. I was sure he was dead. At that moment, I didn't have time for pity. Without a pause, I kept driving the company across that field as fast as we could go. I never looked back. We reached Eindhoven without further resistance. As for Brewer, he miraculously recovered and later joined Easy Company at the end of the war. After Normandy, I wondered if I would ever find any elation in war. When we entered Eindhoven, however, our biggest problem was pushing the troops through the crowds of people that greeted our men. Having suffered over four years of occupation by the Nazis, the reception by the Dutch population of the first Allied soldiers they had seen since April 1940 was unrestrained. It must have been similar to the outpouring of emotion that greeted our troops when they liberated Paris in late August. The streets of Eindhoven were literally engulfed with civilians, smiling, waving, and offering the men drinks and food. Many residents brought chairs from their homes and encouraged our soldiers to sit down and rest for a while. This reception contrasted sharply with what we had encountered in Normandy, where we had been suspicious of snipers posing as French civilians. I was still afraid of snipers after just having seen Brewer get hit, so I put my map case under my pants belt. I next pulled my fatigue jacket over the map case and the binoculars to conceal both. I then turned the collar of my jacket up to conceal my rank. I tried as much as possible to look like just another GI, which was why I always carried an M1 rifle. It just felt good knowing that I could take care of myself in all situations. Easy Company soon pushed through the crowd and secured the bridges over the Dommel River. I figured the party could wait until later. Not getting to that first bridge before it was destroyed on September 17th had left us feeling that we had failed to do our part in accomplishing the assigned mission. However, the guilt didn't last long, since the forward elements of the British armored column did not arrive until the afternoon of September 18th. Then they promptly halted in the center of town, set up housekeeping, and proceeded to make tea. This lack of urgency for the need to push on to the 82nd at Nijmegen and their comrades at Arnhem left us feeling a bit bewildered. By 1830, the main body of the British Guards Armored Division started passing through Eindhoven from the south. This completed the mission assigned to the 506th at the start of the operation. That night, I set up outposts as Colonel Strayer established his battalion headquarters in the center of Tongelre, a suburb on the east side of Eindhoven.